Happy Friday, everyone. Hope everyone had a good week. I'm gonna be discussing some philanthropy today. In a perfect world with Manuela Testolini. Hey, Manuela, how you doing? Good morning, how are you? I'm good, I'm good. That was super smooth how you logged on. So I'm glad that... <laughs> I thought I'd join you from our from our charity account so that people could find us easily. Um, I was in the lunchtime where you are. It's still morning here. We just got the kids logged on for for their uh, tinkering class. All and right. <laughs> well, listen, it's great to have you on. I'm going to do a brief um, introduction just while everyone's logging on here. Um, we are very lucky to have Manuela Testolini today. Uh, she's a world-renowned uh, philanthropist founder and president of In A Perfect World Foundation, which we're gonna be focusing on today. Um, Manuela has a deep impact-driven history in the philanthropic space, which you'll hear about. Uh, she truly believes that kids have the power to change the world and thus created In A Perfect World back in 2005. Uh, this organization helps give kids the tools to succeed. Uh, In A Perfect World has created programs that provide education, mentoring, and artistic expression to underserved and at-risk youth around the world, including Mali, Malawi, Senegal, Haiti, Nicaragua, Nepal, amongst others, and also here in the US uh, across the coast from uh, Washington, DC out to LA. And she has impacted more than 40,000 children worldwide. So very, very impressive. Um, in addition, her foundation has built schools. It's provided grants to inner city classrooms and helped provide uh, youth-driven services. Uh, Manuela has also created a unique youth ambassador program, which we'll talk a little bit more, uh, in which she trains young people to be uh, philanthropists and community leaders themselves. So such a terrific um, initiative, and we'll talk more about what that entails. Uh, prior to In a Perfect World, Manuela was involved with several uh, nonprofit organizations, including Love for One Another, Free Arts Minnesota, and Young Women's Empowerment Network. Uh, Manuela has been widely recognized for her philanthropic work with the Award of Service from the United Communities Against Poverty, the uh, Guide Star Platinum Seal Award, the Boys and Girls Club of America Fearless Leader Award, and the Muhammad Ali Voice of Humanity Honor. Uh, so she is here today to discuss her amazing philanthropic achievements and future vision. Manuela, again, thank you for joining us. A real pleasure to have you on. Yeah, I'm so excited to be here. Wonderful. So we'll start, you know, I want to talk a little bit about your background. You know, many people may not know your background, but you have a very interesting upbringing. And talk a little bit about how your upbringing impacted your philanthropy and your drive to give back. You know, I grew up in Toronto. So if whoever hasn't been to Toronto, Toronto is a very multicultural city. And I didn't realize until I left um, the richness around me. And you know, I grew up with friends, um, one of my best friends, still my best friend to this day was a Sri Lankan refugee. Um, I had friends who had left, you know, fled Iran. I had friends who didn't speak English when I first met them. And so I started to just be surrounded by diverse stories. And whether or not I realized that they, they were impacting my worldview. Um, but then I'm also the, the first generation Canadian in my family. Uh, both my parents are immigrants. My father is from Italy and my mom is from Egypt. And I got to spend summers in those places. And so, you know, spending a few weeks in Italy and then going to spend a few weeks in Egypt, I got to see really how, you know, people live differently. Um, everybody has a different life experience. And I think it really cultivated um, my natural empathy towards people and, and really wanting to know what those stories are. Um, you know, I, I was talking to my mom recently about uh, missing visiting Egypt. And I was talking about how you know, I would play soccer with the kids outside my grandmother's apartment. And I said to my mom one day as a kid, you know, why do these kids like to play soccer without shoes? I don't get it. And she said, well, they don't have shoes. And it was sort of this moment of, wait, wait, wait a minute, why don't they have shoes? And how can I impact that? What can I do to help? And so, you know, we went to the, to the department store and picked up shoes for the kids. But it was really those small experiences that start to open your eyes as a kid and then as a young adult um, that start to really impact how you move through the world. And so when I, you know, went through college um, and then getting on to my career, I really felt like, you know, in all the spaces that I move, I want to have an impact. And so it's really been such a, um, an extension of who I am and how I've been brought up. 
it's a, I mean, it, it's wonderful how that has kind of changed your perspective on the world. Tell us how and why and when you started your foundation in a perfect world. So I started in a perfect world in 2005 um, after being in the nonprofit space for a long time. Um, the work that I was doing at the time, I was focusing on providing um, grassroots organizations with the tools that they needed to succeed. So for instance, I would be at a, a transitional housing facility or um, a domestic violence shelter and meeting with the kind of the higher ups about, you know, what do you need to make this building run well? And after doing that for a while, I realized that the conversation was being held up here and nobody was really talking to the beneficiaries. Um, so again, it kind of drew me back to, you know, what is the story? What is the story of these people um, that are benefiting from these services and how can I impact them directly? And so I started asking this question, okay, now that all the facility things are taken care of in a perfect world, um, you know, what do you need? And I, I'm very much drawn to children. So the conversation quickly went from the grownups to the kids. And I would sit with kids and just kind of ask them this question. And I found that some kids were really willing to voice their, their perfect world scenarios. Um, most of them at the time, I'm gonna date myself now, were you know, Game Boys. They wanted to go to Disney World, they wanted a Game Boy. Um, but I had one kid who I met at a um, domestic violence shelter, family shelter, and he was sitting off in the corner by himself, separated from all the other kids. So we were having this bustling conversation and he was not participating. And he was just kind of there sitting um, coloring. And so I sat beside him and I introduced myself and I asked him this perfect world question and he didn't answer. And so I said, okay, um, is there anything you like? You know, tell me, tell me about yourself. And he was really quiet. And um, he finally said, I want a blue crayon. And I thought, okay, well, he must not understand the scope of what I'm asking him. So I said, okay, pretend I'm a superhero or a magician or a fairy godmother, whatever that may be. If I could snap my fingers and get you something, what would it be? And he never looked up from his paper and he just said, quite simply again, I just want a blue crayon. And I thought, okay, now I, now I need to get to the bottom of the story. Like, what is the story of the blue crayon? So I go and I find the mom. And I said, okay, this is what he's told me. Um, meanwhile, all these other kids are asking for these big grandiose things. And she said that the story was that they had left um, a domestic violence situation in the middle of the night. Uh, she had grabbed his favorite things, his Tonka truck, his teddy bear, all the, all the stuff that she thought he needed. She grabbed his crayons and I guess left behind his favorite blue crayon. And what I took from that conversation was that, you know, meanwhile, I'm gonna start crying now, but she and I were sort of full of tears because she said, she didn't realize now that they were in a safe space, she didn't realize that he needed necessarily anything. <clears throat> else. And she, she realized that, you know, the conversation needed to be had with him. And I said to her, you know, this is, this is what I'm about is about really having these conversations and drawing out these stories. But it also made me realize that some, but sometimes somebody's perfect world is super simple to accomplish. And we just need to ask that question. And so in a perfect world was born from that. Um, and we've been plugging along ever since. That's so, that's so amazing to hear. I mean, I guess the next question is, there's so many children in the world who need help and support. How do you decide where to get involved? I mean, there's just, it's endless possibilities. It is tough. And I think just being in the non nonprofit space, you get, um, it can be overwhelming to see all of the need and know that you can't tackle it all. Um, I was in Mumbai in 2008 and I was volunteering with an organization that, that educated children living in the slums. And I remember standing in the middle of this slum in Mumbai and being so overwhelmed with the number of um, social issues that were happening in one place. So it was alcoholism, domestic violence, teen pregnancy, uh, you know, hygiene and sanitation issues, malnutrition. It was just so much. Um, and so for me, what I have had to do is really focus on where I can have the greatest impact in the shortest amount of time so that I can then replicate that, inspire others to do the same, and then move on. And so I I'd say that most of what we've done has been just very organic. Um, I get introduced to uh, either causes or organizations that I see are doing good work. And I'm about partnership. So if I can go into a community where somebody has been there for some time and take what they're doing and either expand their reach or just amplify that impact, 
um, I do that because I'm not here to reinvent the wheel. Um, there are many organizations doing great work and I feel like if we could all collaborate, we'd get a lot of this done <laughs> very much more quickly. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, it really is about collaboration, not reinventing the wheel so that, you know, so everyone who needs help gets the most attention. I guess, give us a little bit more detail. Once you identify an area in need and you wanna help these children, tell us about the steps that your foundation does to kind of create that infrastructure to help these kids. What are the next steps once you know where you wanna be? So it goes again, back to collaboration. We consider ourselves a convener. So if I find that, you know, for instance, we've, we've just uh, wrapping up a great project in Malawi where we had, um, you know, the need is great for education. So going back to that experience in, in Mumbai, standing there, I realized that of those social ills, looking at all of them in totality, that education is this great equalizer. So if I, if I can start with educating kids, then I know that it's going to impact all of these other things. And so I look for education partners. Um, and once I have that, then I start to build around that kind of like an ecosystem. So in Malawi, what we've done over the last few years is we built um, some schools with our school building partner there. And then we realized, you know, what is still impacting the kids from either going to school, just showing up or um, being successful once they get there. And so for schools in Malawi and, and many developing countries, you know, girls don't show up to school if they're spending their time fetching clean water. So we know we need to put a clean water source close to the school. So then we look for our, who's our clean water partner because I'm not going to buy a drilling rig and start doing that, but I know I can use my resources to find the best partner for that particular project. And then we realize, you know, kids don't come to school when they're hungry or they come to school hungry and they're not <coughs> to learn. So we started a school farm um, so that the school can be supported in that way. So we find our permaculture partner um, to help implement that. And then we decided, you know, let's empower the, the moms in the community to then create a school feeding program. So then the kids show up to school because they know they're getting fed a nutritious meal before they start the day. Um, they've learned about farming initiatives. They've been able to then teach that back to their parents and their parents now have their own sustainable farms at home. And it starts to just kind of build and it's almost this sort of spiral from the school and it starts to spiral out um, and to encapsulate not only the community, but it becomes a model for the communities around them. And I think that, you know, the biggest challenge I have found is um, the nonprofit space can be very um, competitive, maybe is the word, I guess, if people are competing for dollars, let's say, um, they're a little bit suspect of collaboration. And I've, I've really built an amazing network um, strategically of the right partners who get it, who get that if we do this together and everybody brings in their expertise, we're going to be able to have an amplified impact. And so it really starts there with collaboration and convening. Wow. And at, at any point, are you kind of done? Meaning like they are self-sufficient. I can now turn my attention to another location or are you involved in that area forever? So it is always the goal that to empower other people. And so um, in Malawi, when I say we're wrapping up, we are preparing for the handoff of the farm. Um, we, we will still do, um, we'll still have our program manager go and visit to make sure things are plugging along. But now it's, you know, it's your responsibility. It's your responsibility. Now we've been there for two years, participating and helping this get going, educating you and, and training the, the parents and the students. But now it is really time for them to take over because it is really about self-determination. I'm not here to, in, you know, um, impose on you what I think is best. You know, what we start with is community interviews and ask them, you know, what are the needs of the community? You tell us what you need and how we can help you to get there with the end goal being you're going to get there. Um, we're, we're kind of the, I consider uh, in a perfect world, a guide on the side versus a sage on the stage. It's like, we, you know, we're here to, to usher it along, but it really is the goal for them to take over. That's a wonderful statement, how you're a guide on the side. That's a wonderful way to put it, how you're not there to impose, but you're there to just guide, help, mentor, and just get them to where they need to be. You know, you talk about education. I want to focus a little bit about your youth um, ambassador program, which, which I read about and I thought was so fascinating. So basically, you are identifying kids who have potential and you're teaching them the tools to become leaders within their own community. Tell us a little bit about one, how you identify the people who have that leadership potential, 
And two, what are the skills that you give them so that they can be leaders in their own community? So first, I think every kid has potential. Um, I think that what I look for is, um, is their empathy. Um, because I think in order to be an effective leader, you have to start with empathy. And if even if there's a, a glimmer of empathy, I can help to cultivate that and then branch everything out from there. Um, the ambassador program is really built on finding teens who want to make a difference and then helping them build their leadership toolbox and giving them the resources to then go out into the community and make change. Um, it has looked differently um, as COVID hit us last year so that we are, um, we have shifted somewhat towards less in-person group community service projects to really mentoring the kids one-on-one -on -one through their own passion projects, um, which is, it, it was, has been a blessing in disguise because I've really seen them um, dive deeper into the causes they, they really care about. So while we take them in the curriculum through, you know, hunger and poverty and education and homelessness and all these things, now they're able to say, okay, I want to help the trans community. I want to help um, with climate change and really dive in deeper. And it's been um, really fun to watch them grow. We have a, a great group of kids right now who have um, impacted everything from you know, moms and their babies experiencing homelessness to, um, like I said, the trans community re most recently. And, you know, having them build this leadership toolbox, starting from empathy, learning how to advocate, learning how to be an activist, how to use uh, the arts and creative writing for your own expression and advocacy, all of those things kind of come together. And for each of the children, each of the teens, it really, um, it really draws out things they, that they don't, didn't realize were there. Um, and it's really fun to watch. But before we even get to the teens, we actually have a, a, our Dream Catchers program, which is for the littler kids, uh, which kind of feeds into the, the teen program where we have kids who are, you know, five to 12, who are learning about these same big giant global issues, but learning about them through arts and storytelling. So that they start to understand, you know, when they hear rumblings about kids at the border, you know, what does immigration mean? Uh, why do people immigrate? Or, you know, why do they see people on the street? And, and starting to kind of, um, again, um, open their hearts towards other people and understanding those other stories that I was so lucky to be exposed to. Um, and then giving them a chance to serve, whether that means, you know, giving up their own books and toys to send to kids at the border, or, you know, writing letters of hope to doctors who are working, you know, on the front lines during COVID, but really getting them um, the baby steps to act. And then once they get to the teen program, they're ready to get out there. God, that must be so satisfying. I mean, I can't even imagine how rewarding that must be to it see is. that child develop and to reach their potential and then pass on that gift to others. Well, the uh, best part, you know, the thing that has been shut down, unfortunately, with COVID is that um, in 2019, we took our first group of teens to one of our projects, uh, a school project in Guatemala, which was kind of their capstone and we said okay this this will be the thing now once they get through the program they get the chance to go on one of these trips and really see the impact because they're learning about education and poverty in america and they're hearing about education and poverty in a developing country but now they get to, not only to go see it but to impact it so we take them there not to visit but to actually build the school or build the whatever facility we're working on and uh, we're looking forward to getting back to that because those experiences is so fun for me to watch them. So most of them who have never left the country see just, you know, the, the explosion of all that is, yeah. you know, the culmination of what they learned and really putting that into action. Yeah, I mean, when do you think you'll go back to traveling internationally this yeah. year, 2022? 2022 is what I'm hoping for. I think we're, um, I think 2021 is going by really quickly and, yeah. you know, we are, we are in somewhat of a bubble. This is, this is another challenge that I have. I have a hard time just looking at America or Canada. I look at things globally. And so, you know, our communities are struggling um, with vaccination rates being very low, um, infrastructure in the healthcare uh, industry being, you know, so in some cases not even there. Um, so, you know, Malawi and Guatemala and all these places are, are still struggling quite a bit, even though we're doing much better than we were. Yeah, so that's going to be a real limitation. But, you know, I, you know, one of the things that I was so impressed about, I think anyone who's tried to raise money knows that, I mean, I personally feel like fundraising is one of the hardest things to do on the planet. Asking someone for, for money, making sure they understand your mission, getting them involved and believing in it, 
and then giving money is really, really difficult to do, but you have somehow mastered it. What is your secret? <laughs> what is your secret to your successful fundraising? I don't know if I've mastered it because we took, um, I think we had our first fundraiser in our 11th year of existence or 12th year of existence. Um, in part because we were kind of nose down and doing the work and realized, you know, at some point, if this one, if this is going to be sustainable, if this is going to grow, then we do have to actually st start telling people what we're doing. And um, I think the stories are very impactful of the communities um, and the people in them, whether they're here or overseas. And I think that, you know, finding people who are authentically connected to what you're doing and just get it really helps. Um, we are, you know, we're not uh, necessarily out there doing um, consistent fundraising, but we're doing strategic fundraising. So for instance, um, my two daughters who are six and nine, um, who are in our Dream Catchers program, just learned about a boy who um, has autism and how he was trying to um, create a sensory room in his school uh, for kids with autism and other special needs. So they heard about this and like, well, what do you mean? You know, he donated his birthday to raise money and they were like, well, what's autism? I'm like, okay, well, this is interesting because we haven't actually covered this topic yet. Um, and so we sat and, and researched autism. We learned about that. What does it mean for children? And they said, well, you know, we want to help. And so I said, okay, well, let's, how do we help? How do we best help Wilson is his name. And, you know, they went on a campaign and really raised quite a bit of money to not only finish his um, sensory room, but now we've impacted, I think, classrooms in 17 other states because we just, you know, cast the net and said, you know, who else needs help in this particular way? But it was really driven by them because the idea is, you know, don't just tell mama or don't just tell, you know, the, the president of In a Perfect World what you want to have happen, but tell me how you want me to help you make it happen. And so our fundraising has been very grassroots in that way. Um, and then our, we've had two or three, actually we had our last event, um, March 7th of 2020, which is in retrospect, completely insane that we were able to, to pull off um, a luncheon with 250 people in one room right before the world shut down. Um, but we have really curated uh, for our events, um, a great group of attendees, but then also just uh, an experience for people. So they get to know the organization, um, but they get to hear the stories. Again, they get to hear the stories of the kids who participate in our teen program, the people overseas, or even just other people that we're inspired by who are leading the charge and, and whose shoulders I stand upon um, to do what I do. So I think that that makes a big difference. And you're talking about identifying with people who genuinely believe in the same cause you do. And I think that you've done not only an amazing job fundraising, but you've also been very philanthropic and you've given to a lot of causes. How do you form that connection? How do you decide who to support and where to give your money? Because obviously there's so many you know, worthwhile causes out there. You know, I think that um, for me, I focus on causes that are you know, sometimes people only donate to big organizations because they've been there forever. But I look at the ones that are um, up and coming that need the support. Um, but I also pledge to commit to them. I commit to them for three years because I, in my past work, you know, working with organizations that maybe will give a grant um, or a donation to an, a small organization one year, and then they want to support them the next year, but then they're not there anymore. The organization has, has not survived because they have not been able to um, pull in enough support. And so when I find an organization that I like, um, whether because they are you know, directly impacting kids um, or because they are um, a great partner or future partner, it's because I, it's, I do it in a way that I, they know that they're getting my support for three years so that they know they can count on. It. And I encourage other people to do the same. I think that that's a really important way to move through space, but I also know you know, when I first started in a perfect world, I wanted to change the world and I still do, but I realized I can't do it by myself. So, which, which is why I pour into empowering kids and having them, you know, I want to hear their voices. I want to empower them so that we hear them and we see them as future leaders. And if I find other organizations doing the same thing, that's usually where my, where my money goes first.
I mean, that is just so wonderful to hear. I can just tell you as, as someone who has tried to raise money and give money, it is very difficult, one, to fundraise and two, to figure out where the best cause is. And mm -hmm. you've obviously done a great job with that. So, um, you know, you, your, your, your nonprofit has been so tremendously successful. And there are so many nonprofits out there that start. And just like you said, within a year or two, they're gone. They can't really sustain. What would you say are the three most important characteristics to not only your success, but your nonprofit success? Oh, wow. I think that um, I'll go back to empathy again, because if you can't put yourself in the shoes of the people that you're serving, um, I don't think you can be effective. I don't think you can be effective in the long term, because I think assumptions are made and Band-Aid solutions happen, but long-term um, change and sustainability doesn't also necessarily follow. Um, so empathy for sure. Um, collaboration. Um, collaboration for me is key as, you know, there's, I think there are over 2 million nonprofits in America. So why, why have we not figured out a bunch of different things? We should be checking the boxes <laughs> on a number of things at this point. Um, if people can collaborate um, and don't be, don't be scared of, um, giving something up to gain a broader impact. Um, but then the last thing I would say, and this one really revealed itself in the last year, is just flexibility. Um, I, somebody asked me the other day, you know, what, what's a new skill you learned during COVID? I said, oh, I learned to be a ballerina. I said, when did you take ballet? And I said, oh, I've just been pivoting on my, on my toe. <laughs> you know, I've just been pivoting all year long. So um, it really has, we've had to be flexible. We've had to be really um mindful of letting go of perfection and focusing on what we can do um, in the moment and in the changing times. And I think that, um, you know, if you're so rigid that you can't move with either, you know, what, what's happening with your beneficiaries or what's happening in the broader scope of things, um, then you're stuck and you can't grow. So I think those, those are the three things I would say are key. Wonderful to hear. So where do you go from here? What's your dream? What's your, What's your quote unquote endpoint for the in the perfect world? Is there is there a legacy or a goal you're looking for? Um, you know what? As I said earlier, I think that if I can empower more kids with empathy and leadership and connect to their passion so that they are not not that they feel that they have to act, but that they are they're compelled to act. See, I feel compelled <laughs> to do I I want kids to feel compelled to do things. I don't want them to do um, you know, to serve because they have to serve a certain number of hours for school you know, or whatever that is. I really want them to feel compelled to act. And the way that I want people to see our legacy is, is that it's become a movement, a movement of that, a movement of change makers that just keep coming up and inspiring the next group. That one great thing is we've had, you know, some of our ambassadors who've graduated and gone off to college have then referred the next generation, the next group to us. They've had, you know, I, how I have a friend who's um, who would be great for this. And it's, it's organically moving in that direction, which I love. It's so, so inspirational to hear. Um, how can our listeners get involved? How can we support your movement? Follow us. Um, I, we would love to um, get the word out there more about what we're doing, because as I said, we're, we're most of the time nose to the ground doing the work and not really being our own um, loudest cheerleaders. Uh, we also just, uh, started something called The Village last year where people can join a monthly giving circle. It's basically follows our philosophy of little by little, a little becomes a lot. Um, so, you know, people who donate even $15 a month are making a huge impact in the life of a kid. Um, and it really made a difference um, during COVID uh, to be able to help that many more kids and to help kids um, in a greater way with greater needs than they had before. Um, we also launched something uh, most recently called our founder circle for um, for donors who understand the long-term sustainability needs of an organization. Um, so all of that, if you email us at info at iapw.org or check out our website, which is iapw.org, um, you can learn more about that or hit us up on Instagram. Listen, Manuela, I'm going to let you go. I know you're super busy. Um, all I can say is this was very inspirational. You are a breath of fresh air. You. Your motivation to kind of change the world at a grassroots level uh, the movement that you've created, uh, you should be very, very proud. It, it's, it's, it really, uh, it's just very inspiring. And so again, thank you for all your time. Thank you for all you've done and good luck the rest of the way. I mean, I, it's, it's really amazing what you've, you know, thank what you've you. done so far.
appreciate you giving us this platform today. Absolutely, Manuel. Have a great day. Thanks. Talk to you soon. Bye. Take care.